I use the term espers and characters interchangeably throughout this video, just keep in mind they're the same thing and refer to the playable characters in this game. This Light is an urban fantasy turn-based RPG mobile game that was released May 10th this year. The general gist of the game is that the characters are blessed with powers from deities from various cultures. For example, Clara is a character whose benefactor is Hera, who as you probably already know is a goddess from Greek mythology. Cecilia received powers from Isis, a goddess from Egyptian mythology. The thing that drew me to this game is hands down the character designs, I love the cast. My favorite character in the game and the one that got me to download the game after I saw him in an advertisement on YouTube is Li Ling. I am inherently biased towards Li Ling because his benefactor is Neja. I didn't grow up with cable TV, so I spent a lot of my childhood watching The Legend of Neja and Journey to the West, so seeing a character based on Neja definitely caught my attention. Noja is an incredibly well-known figure, so Dislight isn't the first game that's had a character based on Noja, but I personally like the way Dislight handled the adaptation of the character the most. Li Ling's design screams Noja to me. He has Noja's signature spear and signature fire wind wheels. Noja does have a form where he has multiple heads and arms, so I presume that's where Li Ling's extra four arms are based on. In Noja's lore, he sacrifices himself and then is later resurrected through a lotus flower. I believe that's why pink is a large factor in his character design. In addition, if you ever pull Li Ling, his pull animation shows him appearing from a lotus flower as well. In an earlier version of Li Ling's model, the Chinese characters on his pants said Zhuan Sheng E Tong, which is something along the lines of reincarnated bad boy. Later, the model was updated to match his artwork, and now the characters are Jiang Shi E Tong, which is probably something along the lines of bad boy who has ascended upon this world. Li Ling's last name Li is the same as Ne Jia's dad's. In Ne Jia's lore, his dad's name is Li Jing. Li Ling's personality and lore is pretty reflective of Nuja's. For example, Li Ling is the youngest child in his family, as was Nuja. Besides preserving a lot of Nuja's core design elements, Li Ling himself feels like an incredibly well-designed original character. Besides Li Ling, some other character designs I really like personally are Tang Xuan, Heng Yue, and Disc Boom. Another thing I like about the dislike character cast is the diversity. To begin with, there is a good male-to-female ratio. There are currently 40 playable male characters and 41 playable female characters, leaving the game with an almost perfect 1-to-1 -one -one ratio. A lot of the anime-style gacha games I play tend to have terrible male-to-female ratios, namely having an overwhelmingly large amount of female characters. The next thing that I appreciate about Dislight is the skin color diversity among their characters. Another common trend in similar games I've played in the past is a complete lack of darker skinned characters in the game. The next thing I want to bring up is body type diversity. By no means do I think Dislight is perfect, but nevertheless, it is one of the few games I've played that at least attempts to include different body types, especially among their female character cast. Also, this isn't a big deal, but I do want to do a quick shout out to Pandora, who is the first bald female character I've seen in a game. And I want to do another shout out to Tang Xuan, who is the first male character I've seen in a game wearing tights. The last thing I'm going to bring up is age diversity. From my experience with playing games of similar style, the character ages tend to lean towards a younger side without much diversity. I am not counting characters that are of ridiculous ages like 500 plus years who appear like they are around 20. Once again, I don't think this is something Dislike is perfect with either, but I feel there is more age variety in this game compared to others. I know everyone has their own preferences, but for me, unless the game has some sort of premise that doesn't allow it to have a lot of variety, for example, I don't expect a game like Love Live to have male characters, etc. Diversity in character cast is something I value greatly, and I think Dislight, while not perfect, is one of the more diverse games I've seen. I've played other games that have had full auto features. Dislight also has a full auto feature, but it takes it to another level by allowing you to multi-battle. This means the game will full auto up to 10 fights in a row, so you don't have to manually start each fight. So I can do multi-battle, enter. Not only that, Dislight allows you to do other things while a multi-battle is happening. For example, you can work on doing point war and holo battle fights while your espers farm relics in Chronos 10, etc. So I have a multi-battle going on here and I can do whatever else I want in the game while it's going on. At the end of the day, Dislight is a gacha game and as a free-to-play player, you are generally not going to be able to obtain every single character you want. However, putting that aside, I personally find Dislight to be an incredibly free-to-play game. In your first 10 pulls, you have a 50-50 chance of either getting Li Ling or Tang Xuan. Li Ling is more or less arguably one of the top 10 espers in the game and arguably the third or fourth strongest DPS. While Tang Xuan isn't as strong as Li Ling, he too is a very viable starting unit that you can depend on when you start the game. Tang Xuan and Li Ling are both viable for endgame content as well. 
In addition, some of the strongest legendary espers are also obtainable free to play. For example, Gabriel, who is arguably the third strongest esper in the game right now, is only obtainable from this in-game feature called Esper Fusion. Lucas, who is also probably one of the top 10 strongest espers, can be obtained for free from clearing stage 100 of Spatial Tower. Ye Su Hua and Dahlia, who can also be viable espers, are only obtainable from Ripple Dimensions, which is another in-game feature. Another aspect of this game that makes it free to play is that a lot of the 3-star and 4-star espers are very viable in endgame content, making it not as much of a necessity to have 5-stars, which is the highest rarity in the game. Drew, who is a 3-star esper you will get very early on from the story, is a staple esper in content like Kronos 10 and Apep 10. Tangyun and Birnis, two other 3-star espers, are also go-to for content like Fafnir 10. Changpu is a 3-star healer that you can rely on if you don't end up pulling a higher rarity healer all the way to endgame. Units like Jiangman, Mona, who you get for free, etc., are good 4-star options if you don't end up getting rarer espers for the boss Shadowfire. Chloe is a 4-star esper who is a monster at cleaving the HP of enemy teams. There are quite a few more that I haven't mentioned, but these are a few examples. The gacha system in Dislight is honestly not the best I've seen in a game, but I find it acceptable and I wouldn't say it's bad either. In order to pity or guarantee the featured 5-star character in a banner, you need a max of 430 pulls, 450 minus the 20 pulls you get from spin rewards during a raid of banner. This may sound like a lot, but Dislight does give out free pulls considerably faster than other similar games that I have played. In addition, pulls in Dislight are literally farmable because they have a chance of dropping from farmable content such as Kronos 10, etc. If you play Genshin Impact, this is the equivalent of being able to get Primo Gems from doing Artifact Domains. In general, it is 120 pulls to guarantee a 5-star Esper. You are guaranteed a 4-star Esper every 20 pulls, which is higher than other similar games I have played. The chances of pulling a 5-star Legendary is 1%, which is typical for a gacha game in my opinion. One thing I'd say that is not favorable about Dislight's Raid Up banners is that if you do get a Legendary Esper, it only has a 10% chance of being the featured Legendary Esper. This is considerably lower than other games. In addition, the new 4-star characters that are generally released with a new 5-star character do not receive any type of Raid Up at all in banners. However, unlike other games, new characters are permanently added to the standard pool right after the Raid Up banner is over. Generally, most gacha games will wait a period of time before adding featured characters to the standard pool or will never add featured characters to the standard pool. In addition, so far every other banner, one new 4-star Esper has been obtainable from an event. Another thing that makes Dislight different from other gacha games I have played is that once you do pity the featured legendary Esper, you can't pity them again. On one hand, this can suck for players who may want dupes of the featured character, but on the other hand, Dislight as a game tries to not require players to have dupes of an Esper in order to utilize the Esper, and if you want other Espers besides a featured character, this is a positive thing. On a side note, if you do want to whale in Dislight, the monthly card, the upgraded monthly card, and the upgraded battle pass are all insanely good deals. There are other sales that are pretty decent, but most notably, these are very good. Dislight is a game that is, in my opinion, very new player friendly. As mentioned before, in your first 10 pulls, the game will either give you Liling or Tangxian. Both espers are very solid and are ones that you can depend on as you progress and as you enter the end game. In addition, for the first 30 days, you get a 100% EXP boost, which is incredibly helpful. There are also a series of missions, etc. when you first start the game that helps guide you through the game while also giving you useful rewards to speed up your progression. The game presents information in digestible chunks and at a comfortable pace. The game also has courses. Which are missions designed to help give you direction in the game. I found them as a very good reference for when I first started the game and felt lost. The missions also give out useful rewards that help with your progression as well. The courses also have tips that are genuinely pretty useful. I personally found the ones on the desolate land bosses useful when the content was first released. The game also makes it very easy to reference how other players are building the espers and or what teams they are using for different content. I find this very helpful when trying to get a general idea of what direction I may consider investing in. If you click on any strategy option for almost any content in this light, you can see top formations community-wise and top formations within your friends. I personally found it useful to see different team formations for a temporal tower to get some ideas if I felt like I was getting stuck. You can go to any esper in the game, click the strategy button, and find lots of useful information. The basic info tab is a good place to get 
a quick snapshot of what the rest of the community is doing. You can also go to the performance tab and view how top players are building said Esper, what content they are using the Esper in, and what teams they are running with said Esper. In the friends tab, you can look at how your friends are building the Esper if they have the Esper. For example, if we want to stock ad hoc here, we'll go find ad hoc. Where is ad hoc? And then we can see what he's building on his Liling. When you resonate an Esper in the game, you can reference where other players are putting their points into. If you go to any player's tab, you can view their top Espers and how they're built and their best clear times for certain content and also what teams they used for said content. If you go to any of your own Espers, you can share them with other players in game as well through all chat, private messages, etc. This site also has other resources outside the game. I only really follow the official Dislike YouTube, Twitter, and Discord, so I can't speak for their other official social media platforms, but their Discord has a very useful FAQ channel. When I was working towards clearing Cronus 10, I found the information on the boss in this channel very helpful. One of the most notable resources here is a Dislike tier list, which is incredibly useful for helping you decide on which espers to invest in, how to invest in them, and what team comps to use for various content. There is a standard tier list, a tier list rating espers depending on the content, how to build espers, and suggested team compositions. Obviously, at the end of the day, it is best to do your own research and seek personalized advice from trustworthy sources, but I find these in-game features and other resources very useful for getting a general quick idea of what an esper looks like. This light is going to be a casual player friendly game just because it's stand based and it has a full auto and multi battle feature. However, while this light isn't going to be as grindy as a typical MMO, I feel the game has a decent amount of content to engage with and it's easy to spend hours in the game. Most notably, getting through content like Temporal Tower can generally be a time sink. This light is made by Lilith Games and so far I am satisfied with the company. The company is supportive of their player base. The official Dislike Twitter can be constantly seen liking community fan art, commenting on fan art, and retweeting fan art. While it's certainly not as frequent, the official Dislike YouTube occasionally interacts with comments. I remember when the Bloody Hunt trailer dropped, me and my friend Club were freaking out because Dislike had liked his comment, which is this one right here on the screen. Dislight has collaborated with DeviantArt to host an art contest that had a total price pool of around 25,000 USD. On Dislight's official website, they feature fan art of the game. Dislight has a large TV program that anyone can apply for. The program aims to support players who may be interested in making content for the game. You are compensated based on certain factors like how well your content performs. I have not had a lot of experience with the program, but so far I find the program satisfactory. The application process is smooth, the people who manage a program are usually pretty responsive, the expectations are clear, and the rewards are good. This site can also be seen commissioning artists and also sponsoring various content creators as well. This site so far has had an amazing social media presence. I feel the company makes solid use of their official social media platforms, including Twitter, Discord, and YouTube to communicate with their player base, promote new content, and upcoming content, etc. And as someone whose passion is not graphic design, I am personally very impressed by Dislight's graphic design and motion design team. I love the visuals across all their socials and personally vibe with aesthetics a lot. The biggest thing for me personally so far is adjustments Lilith Games has made to the pity system in Dislight. On the first banner, Ollie's banner, in the worst case scenario, it would take 850 pulls to guarantee the character featured in the banner. While I do not think something like this should have happened to begin with, very shortly after the banner's release, Lilith Games sent all players in-game mail with a 10 pull compensation and promised that they had heard the community's complaints and would make appropriate adjustments. During the next banner right after, Ahmed's banner, the max amount of pulls needed to guarantee the character featured in the banner was reduced from 850 pulls to 570 pulls. And finally, in the banner right after, Zora's banner, that pity was further reduced to 450 pulls. I already gave my thoughts on how I feel about the 450 pity, so I will not go into it again. But overall, while I do hope that the pull rates are further improved on, in the context of dislike, I find 450 pulls reasonable, and it means a lot to me to see how quickly and effectively this issue was dealt with by the company. The second biggest thing for me is a recent change Lilith Games made to relic farming in the game. 
In this light, relics are items you can equip your characters with to make them stronger. There is a lot of RNG involved in this gear system. However, after the 3.0.3 patch, relic sets that were more valued and relic stats that were more valued had their drop rate increase, while relic sets that were less popular had their drop rates decreased. There are probably other games out there that have done this, but in my personal experience, this light is the first game I've played that has acknowledged what gear and or stats are more valued or less valued and adjusted drop rates accordingly. This light has an in-game live chat customer support service. I have not made use of the function often, but so far the company has been relatively responsive in addressing any concerns I had and answering any questions I had had. This light's endgame PvE content is amazing. First and foremost, despite being a relatively new game, it has a lot of uniquely different endgame PvE content. This light has Cube 8, Story Mode Pugatory, Cronus 10, Apep 10, Fafnir 10, Temporal Tower, Shadowfire, Shadow Gale, Shadow Stream, and very soon we should be getting a Shimmer Boss in Desolate Lands as well. Each of these content areas have their own distinctly unique feel to them. In addition, these content areas are challenging. And because the endgame PV content in this light has a lot of variety and is challenging, you will find yourself needing to build different units and adjusting your strategy depending on what you're facing and what resources you have at your disposal. Cronus 10 is a boss that does more damage the lower your HP is. Generally, for this boss, you try to take note of three things. Number one, healing and tanking. Number two, killing the boss before it kills you. Number three, preventing the boss from taking action. For newer players, generally clearing Cronus 10 is a mix of all three strategies, requiring players to have some DPS, some controllers, and some healers and tankers. For endgame players, they aim to nuke the boss as quickly as possible, relying on mainly all DPS and a few buffers. Fafnir 10 is a high maintenance boss that requires a lot of multi-hit espers. This allows espers such as Tangyun, Biranis, Luyi, Lin, etc. to really shine. The Temporal Tower is something that has 50 stages. These 50 stages reset monthly, presenting new challenges each time it resets. Because this game has only been out for a few months, we haven't really gotten a lot of updates yet, but nevertheless, the recent July 12th update is one of my favorites. The patch brought us three new bosses, Shadow Fire, Shadow Gale, and Shadow Stream. As mentioned before, these bosses hands down felt different from not only the previous endgame content we received, but despite having similar names, the bosses themselves were distinct from each other. Unlike previous content, desolate land boss fights were timed, boss attack patterns were scripted, the fights themselves allowed up to 6 espers instead of 5, and also introduced a new concept of a front and back line not previously seen. The biggest selling point of the desolate land bosses for me is that this content single-handedly made espers that were at the bottom of the tier list highly relevant. First of all, generally none of the bosses are affected by debuffs. This instantly shut off the usual controller meta. As mentioned before, each boss brought forth a new unique mechanic and this allowed certain espers to shine. Shadowfire heavily emphasizes AoE espers. With the inclusion of this boss, most notably Xiang Man and Mona are now very viable espers. Before this, Xiang Man and Mona were largely considered espers not worth investing in because their main strength was farming, a role that wasn't incredibly important, wasn't incredibly hard to fill, and there were lots of other options like Li Ling and Tang Xuan that were also good for other content as well. Shadow Gale heavily emphasizes debuff removal and providing buffs. This allowed espers like Catherine, who generally wasn't a popular unit, to build a place to shine. Another thing I appreciate about this light is that it doesn't lock any key progression points behind endgame content. For example, Temporal Tower is endgame content that offers arguably solid rewards such as Legendary Starry Mon. However, you can also obtain Legendary Starry Mons from farming practice story mode stages. Therefore, if you can clear TT, it's nice, but if you can't, it won't cripple your progression. If this light continues to put out endgame PV content of this quality that is unique and challenging, I think it puts a game in a very solid place. I generally enjoy competitive content in games. I feel the inclusion of PvP content and or ranks automatically leads to a game having more content in the end game. PvP content generally will also give leeway to more strategies, etc. because in most games, PvP and PvE are different from one another. This light has two PvP content areas, Point War and Holo Battle. Point War is PvP between individual players and Holo Battle is PvP between clubs. I'll talk about Point War first. Point War has 18 ranks or tiers from tier 1 to tier 18. I like ranks in games that have the following features, allows all ranks a benefit in some way, rewards higher ranked players in some way, doesn't lock exclusive rewards and rewards that are necessary to play the game behind ranks. Ranks are noticeable in game, allowing for players who are part of their rank to be able to display it. I feel in this way, rankings in games allow potential for content that appeals to both casual players and hardcore players, which I feel is a general struggle in most games. 
Rankings are somewhat similar to cosmetics where they can be nice to have, but don't affect your ability to play the game. In other words, you can be proud of your rank and show it off, but if you don't care, it doesn't really matter either. This site gives out the same rewards to all players regardless of their rank, and all players have access to the same items in the Point War shop. The higher ranked players will get more of said rewards and be able to purchase items from the shop faster. This rewards hardcore players, but also doesn't lock out more casual players as well because rewards aren't exclusive. The rewards from participating in Point War are pretty solid. In Point War, every player sets a defensive team. When you fight other players, you are fighting the defensive formation they have set. Certain espers and or team formations are more suited for defending. When you attack other players, you can choose who you want to fight and also adjust your formation accordingly. Next, I will talk about Holo Battle. There are for sure downsides of having competitive guilds, clan, club, etc. content in the game. The biggest challenge for me with competitive club content is that it can be hard to find other people who share the same level of competitiveness as you do. For example, if you are a casual player, it might be hard to find a club that is more laid back, and if you are a more competitive player, it can be frustrating to not be able to find others who are as motivated to push higher in rankings as you. Nevertheless, Despite these factors, I personally really enjoy competitive group content in games. I like having motivation to work with others to build a club, guild, etc. up in a game. Holo Battle leans more towards a work solo to achieve things together model. There are three Holo Battle rounds each week, with each round lasting two days. Club members can do their fights whenever is best for them during the two day period. I like this because generally people have differing life schedules and or some players prefer less social interaction when playing games. Holo Battle is similar to Point War, but there are differences. Some notable ones are that Point War is 5 vs 5, while Holo Battle is 3 vs 3, and if a unit dies during a round, that unit is unusable until the next round. Differences like this do lead to different strategies. Dislight by no means is perfect, however, compared to other games, I find Dislight to be one of the more flexible games in regards to team formations and gearing. There are certain espers and certain builds that are considered better or the best, but overall so far I haven't found that I've needed a specific esper or needed to build an esper a specific way in order to do well in content. First and foremost, there inherently is going to be flexibility in team formations just because this is a gacha game with a relatively large pool of characters. Therefore, not everyone is going to have the same pool of espers to choose from. In addition, people are going to have espers at different gear levels, and therefore, even if two people have the same espers, depending on the level of investment into said espers, it might not be possible to replicate the same results. While well, you are going to see trends in which espers are being used and how certain espers are built, overall you will see different espers and builds across content, especially in places like Temporal Tower, Point War, Holobato, etc. For example, on the screen right now, there are examples of vastly different team formations for Temporal Tower Stage 25, and this is the team I personally use to clear. Also, inherently, there is going to be flexibility in gearing because Dislight's gear system, Relics, is largely RNG, so no two players will have the same relics to work with. In Dislight, subsets are incredibly important, sometimes more than the set effects, so that will also inevitably lead to more flexibility when building a character. In other words, you might choose one movie set over another because you have better speed sets on one versus the other. There is also flexibility in choosing how you gear a character based on your preferences, the team the character is going to be in, what you're using the character for, the subsets, etc. For example, Leading is viable with War Machine, Hammer of Thor, Hades, Sword Avatara, and Fiery Incandescence. In very rare cases, you can even use Tyranny of Zeus on him. This slide also supports flexibility in gearing and team formations because the gear in the game, relics, are universal across all characters. You can move relics from one of your espers to another. In addition, the game also has preset pages that allow you to move relic sets easily from one character to another or change relic sets on one character. As mentioned earlier, Dislight does have meta characters, so I want to expand on this. Dislight has various content areas that require different strengths, therefore generally even if a character you like is bad in one content area, there's a good chance they are good in a different content area. Vice versa, even if a character is broken in one content area, there is probably a content area they don't perform well in. In this way, Dislight does have meta characters, but the game overall doesn't feel like a certain handful of characters are dominating the whole game. The flexibility in the game that I have mentioned also contributes to the game not feeling super meta dominated. And if for whatever reason, let's say the character you like is not good in any content areas, as mentioned earlier, relics are universal across all characters. Alongside this, it will not cost you an arm and leg to build a character in Dislight, so you are free to build your favorite characters without many negative consequences. Dislight's main story is not the best, but not the worst. Overall, I'd say it's decent. It used to not have voice acting, but recently they added it. Dislight's event stories are alright as well. 
The voice acting in this game is not the best either, but it's acceptable. However, what I do surprisingly like about this site are the bounty stories. You occasionally will get a character's side story as a daily bounty mission. These stories feature unexpected, wholesome, and or funny interactions between various characters in this site that allow you to understand the characters better, and I honestly love these more than the main story and event stories. One of my favorites, personally, is a story between Jiang Man and Lin. Jiang Man is a character who has lost all her memories. One thing she can't remember is what her favorite foods were or what she liked or didn't like to eat. Lin then spends hours making a bunch of different dishes for Jiang Man to try out to help her remember what her preferences are. Another story I liked was the one between Lucas and Bardon. There is a movie that Bardon wants to see, however, things keep coming up and Bardon keeps missing the chance to see the movie. Lucas continues to try to help him see the film, but eventually the film is no longer in theaters. However, Lucas still doesn't give up, gets the film, gathers a bunch of friends together, and Bardon finally gets the chance to watch the whole thing with Lucas and the others. Long Mian is a taxidermist. A lot of people generally don't take interest in what he does. In general, he is pretty cold towards others. However, when Lin's pet bird passes away, Long Mian takes great care to preserve the body upon her request. Lin is very thankful. She also comes to appreciate the work Long Mian does, and Long Mian has a moment of vulnerability and connection with Lin when he shares with her the first thing he preserved, his pet dog who had passed away many years ago. And finally, the last bounty story I will talk about is one of Ollie's. In this story, you learn he has a cactus named Frosty that he really cares about. Ollie notices something is wrong with Frosty and consults Azanith, someone who can talk to plants. Azanith confirms that Frosty has a fungal infection, which leaves Ollie in a state where he's struggling between his desire to be overprotective of Frosty, but also wanting to respect Frosty's desire to spend time outside. This light has a beatmap mini game called DJ Contest. I have played quite a few beatmap games including Idolish 7, Love Live, Muse Dash, etc. And while Dislight's DJ contest by no means is as sophisticated as the beatmaps in a dedicated beatmap game, I find it pretty decent. The thing I appreciate about beatmaps and Dislight the most is that they are actually challenging. My personal experience with beatmaps as minigames is that they tend to be easy. There probably are other beatmaps out there that have this concept as well, but I find Dislight's beatmaps unique in the sense that there is a strategy where you don't need to do anything to keep your full combo. When you do the beatmaps in the game, part of the strategy is determining whether or not you even need to move to hit certain notes. Maybe I have just played games with very neglected side content, but I feel that the DJ content is generally pretty well cared for. You can get daily rewards from the minigame, new tracks are updated pretty often, and there is some lore relevance to the game as well. Each track is associated with a character in the game that allows you to understand them a bit better. And finally, I like the music. I feel like that is an important aspect of beatmap games as well. I love the music in Dislight. As I mentioned before, Dislight is an urban fantasy themed game. To fit the theme of the game, you'll find EDM, pop, rap, hip hop, etc. And obviously everyone's music tastes are different, but these are pretty much my favorite genres of music, so the soundtrack of this game is something I vibe with quite a lot. There are so many tracks I love from this game, but I'm going to play some of my favorites. Say something, but
This site currently has three EPs and one single on Spotify that are also available on YouTube that feature original soundtracks from the game. It seems that they will most likely release one EP every other event and one single every other event. The EPs and singles generally are tracks that feature the new 5-star legendary in the banner. At the end of the day, I know that some people have their preferences. In other words, some people don't like gacha games or don't like turn-based games and that's fine. I also know that some people just have too much on their plate already and can't financially, emotionally, etc. handle another game and that's fine as well. However, regardless, this site is a free to download game and can be played on mobile or on PC through Bluestacks and I would recommend giving the game a try if you haven't already and want to.